I'm Tony Verstandy, Chair of the Middle East Programs at the Aspen Institute. I'm especially pleased um, to welcome you here today. Uh, we are here in conversation with Dr. Salam Fayyad and Ambassador Jeff Feltman. Friends and colleagues, uh, Jeff has traveled a great distance. He's recently returned from Dushanbe and Salam has joined us from Palestine. Uh, I couldn't be uh, happier to have both of my dear friends and colleagues here today. Walter is um, joining us, and it is a distinct honor and privilege for Walter Isaacson, the President and CEO of the Aspen Institute, to be in conversation on such a timely and important topic. Because we have so many people in the room here today, I will um, not go on and on because there's so much for us to um, discuss. So I will turn the conversation over to Walter, uh, who will tee up what I know will be a very interesting conversation, but a warm and hearty welcome to Salam and Jeff. Thank you very much, okay. Walter. Hey, thank you. Over thank to you, you, Tony, for putting this together. Welcome to the first event in our new conference room, which. Uh, is uh, nice to have. A shout out to Khalid um, Fayad, Khalid Fayad, who is the son of one of our speakers, but used to uh, work here as the, um, I guess you were the uh, Butch Cassidy to Kevin Sundance kid, uh, <laughs> and putting things together. It's nice to have you back, and nice to have all of you here. Uh, Ambassador Feltman uh, has uh, been a career foreign service officer and obviously handled this for the State Department, but for those of you who haven't followed things recently, he is now at the United Nations as the, please give me the title again? Under Secretary General for Political Affairs. Right, so handling it for Ban Ki-moon. And everybody knows uh, Dr. Fayad, a longtime friend of the Aspen Institute. Unemployed. Unemployed. Uh, <laughs> itinerant laborer, but he comes to Aspen and he comes to Washington. We're pleased to have you back. And of course, you're uh, not unemployed. You are very much a part, I hope, of the future of Palestine. And I want to ask you about that, given what happened this summer. What do you see the future steps should be for this Palestinian people and the Palestinian Authority? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Walter. Uh, real pleasure and privilege for me to be with you here again at Aspen. <coughs> Uh, especially delighted to be here with my old friend Jeff Feltman. Thank Tony for words of introduction. Uh, good question, and uh, uh, I think relating it to where we are, uh, particularly after the devastation of war that lasted about 51 days uh, in Gaza and around it, uh, I think the question is where do we go from here, given all of that, and whether <coughs> the tragedy of it, all notwithstanding, uh, a way forward could be found, uh, including, of course, the immediate task of dealing with the immediate aftermath of the war in terms of the humanitarian relief work that needs to be done. But beyond that, uh, badly needed reconstruction, given uh, the extensive damage that has taken place, uh, a lot of events and activity uh, are underway in connection with this latter task. But this is not to really skip over uh, the most uh, urgently needed work that needs to continue to be done uh, in the peer period immediately ahead, and I believe for several months, uh, given the devastation uh, of the war. Question is, uh, politically, whether this may pave the way for doing something to deal with the root causes of the conflict. And I think this is really good starting point of analysis. Uh, a lot of people looking at this, even when the war was going on, looking beyond what was badly needed in terms of securing a ceasefire, whether in the nature of something uh, like a humanitarian respite or uh, something in the context of uh, United Nations activity, Security Council resolution and all, but even in the midst of the war, people were looking beyond it in terms of what needs to be done to ensure that this does not keep happening uh, so what is the here. silver lining of this cloud? I don't know if there's a silver lining uh, to this. I, mean, I, I think one can be generated, one should be generated, uh, uh, on the basis of what needs to be done. I think uh, I see and I hear a lot of voices calling for, uh, again, dealing with the root causes of the conflict, with that meaning rushing back into negotiations without any adjustments, without serious preparation. And I, and I do not think that would be necessarily 
productive. I don't think that's really the right way to go. So we shouldn't rush into negotiations? No, uh, I think what we really should do, I think definitely a, a process of sorts need to be needs to be resumed at some point, and the sooner the better, but not before critical adjustments are made to the existing paradigm. We've been doing this for more than 20 years. And what critical adjustment would be the most important? There are two that come to mind uh, in the main. I spoke about that, the Atlantic Council, uh, 31st of July, 25 year, uh, days into the war. And I think there are two elements that need to be addressed. One relates to the question of Palestinian representation. Uh, and the second relates to uh, Oslo, uh, originally an interim arrangement having become an open-ended interim arrangement. I spoke to that also at Aspen, at the first and second of July. With respect to the first question, uh, Palestinian representation, uh, I do not believe uh, there can be much disagreement uh, that it's not adequate anymore either to deal with the requirements of peacemaking or to deal with the requirements of national governance, given that the system has grown to become highly dichotomous in, 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 in a very obvious way. It mainly consists of two camps. One has the, the jury power of representation, that is the PLO and the factions under it. Uh, but unfortunately, given the failure of the process to produce a resolution over the past 20 years has become very weak. And the second does not have the jury power to represent the Palestinian people, but has a lot of presence with the people in terms of it being more reflective of where they are on some key tenets of peacemaking. Question of violence, for example. Uh, question but I'm of sorry, who is the second? How would you characterize uh, that? Factions not under the PLO, like Hamas, Jihad, and others. Uh, and uh, so you, you have to find a way of dealing with this. I recall, as a matter of fact, during the most recent round of diplomacy, between July of last year and through April of this year, the question that was uh, asked by the Israelis often was, all right, we're negotiating with the PA or the PLO, but what about Gaza? Uh, meaning, what about Hamas? What about these other factions? Uh, I think that was a valid question, and that continues to be a valid question. Uh, a way has to be found to make a whole out of these two camps, so to speak, uh, notwithstanding the commitments made by the PLO on behalf of all Palestinians uh, in September of 1993. A way has to really be found, and I think one can be found, uh, to deal with this uh, political pluralism, uh, if you will. There are reasons why those other factions, Hamas and Jihad, have grown in strength. There are reasons why, you know, belligerents started to be viewed as something that pays off, and violence. Uh, failure of the process for much of the past 20, 20 years certainly has contributed to that. This is something that has to be taken into account. Now, Hamas, uh, Jihad, and like-minded factions do not accept the commitments made by the PLO on behalf of all Palestinians in September 1993. I do not know if it is really uh, too productive to engage in an activity aimed at convincing them to change their mind uh, anytime soon. Uh, that's not likely. Well, I'm sorry, so you don't see a reconciliation of the PA structure with Hamas anytime soon? No, I think reconciliation is important to take place, uh, but I think it can be uh, achieved on the basis of something less than what the existing paradigm requires. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I wish it to be so, but because that's a reality. You know, Hamas is not about to accept the commitments entered into by the PLO on behalf of all Palestinians in September 1993. What do you do? They do have power of representation. They do have presence with people. They happen to reflect the state of mind, they and Jihad Islami and others, uh, of Palestinians to a much larger extent than does the PLO today. So this is a reality that has to be taken into account. Another relates to, Iraq, the, to the other key commitment made by the PLO back in September 1993, which relates to the renunciation of violence. Uh, as everyone knows, Oslo stands on two key commitments on the part made by the PLO. One relates to recognition by the PLO of the right of the state of Israel to exist in peace and security. And the second one uh, deals uh, with the renunciation of violence. Uh, and the PLO did accept those two requirements. Hamas accepts neither. Jihad accepts neither. Uh, what do you do? Uh, we would like for there to be consensus on those two uh, issues for sure. But if we can't find one, I don't think it's really wise to continue to wait until that kind of cons consensus can be forged. The question is, can we as a practical matter find a way 
without abrogating the commitments made by the PLO on behalf of Palestinian people to make sense out of this diversity on part of Palestinians to try to move forward. So this is one set of consideration, uh, considerations. The other relates to the fact that Oslo has in effect become an open-ended interim arrangement. Contradiction of terms, obviously. Uh, the commitments made thereunder made sense in the context of a process that was supposed to yield results in five years. May 1999 was the presumptive end date of negotiations on permanent status issues. Well, we are more than 15 years beyond that now, and it has not happened. So clearly, something needs to be done in order for that process to once again be bookended by something other than continued occupation. Mm -hmm. Unless that adjustment is made, then you know there will be this absurd situation, uh, perpetuation of this absurd situation where we Palestinians would continue to be asked and expected to continue to negotiate with Israel, accept either accept that which Israel has on offer, <coughs> or failing that, accept the reality of continued oppressive occupation. And I think to say that this is another. But how situation, can you set a deadline? You know. Uh, Oslo itself was bookended by something. Uh, negotiations with so-called permanent status issues were supposed to be concluded by May 1999. So there was a, a deadline of sort, but that was not respected, and we ran over, and we, we have been running over now, for more than 15 years. But why would Israel accept a deadline saying, if we don't get it by this date, we will end our occupation? First of all, uh, let me make it clear. Uh, when I say we need a date certain for ending the occupation, uh, it is intended in the main to deal with what has become an absurd situation, an absurdity, really, because here we are, there are two parties to this process, Israelis and Palestinians, the other principles. Uh, Israel happens to be holding on to the cars, to the land. Mm -hmm. It has to withdraw and relinquish control over that territory in order for that sovereign state of Palestine to emerge on the territory occupied by Israel in 1967, in Gaza Strip, in West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Uh, there is an inherent uh, imbalance uh, in, in the relationship between the two, <coughs> the occupier and the occupied. If the process continues to go on in the way it started, going back to late 1993, and continue to be up until, to make sense until 1999, uh, then what is really out there to impart some balance to this process? <laughs> Once we cross the threshold of 1999, it appears that we really are in a situation where we either accept that which is on offer by Israel, again with this massive uh, imbalance uh, in power between the two sides, or accept reality of occupation. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Point number two, which I'd like to make on this one, the fact that I'm calling for there to be agreement on a date certain for ending the occupation, it is intended to restore at least the intent of what Oslo was supposed to be about. Oslo was not supposed to be about an open-ended process. But two, that this thinking does not preempt the need for negotiations. Uh, but we need to have the process book ended by something that's related to the core objective of Oslo, to, which Oslo itself, by the way, was, was implicit on for, for uh, reasons that I don't know if there's time to get into, uh, ending the Israeli occupation that began in 1967, an emergence of the sovereign state of Palestine on territory occupied in 1967. So something like this needs to happen. Uh, a, a date that can be agreed, and, and then negotiations should proceed mm -hmm. to deal with permanent status issues. I, I'm not saying that, you know, there is a, uh, that the effort should be about finding a date certain, but then things will happen automatically. There is precedent to this. The United Kingdom, when it relinquished control over Hong Kong, uh, that was a process that was supposed to take five years and end in 1990. Uh, 97. Mm -hmm. Negotiations did take place between Great Britain and China on the fate of Hong Kong and how authority was supposed to be transferred and the rest of it. There were many problems. There was a lot of acrimony. But there was no uncertainty as to the date when this was supposed to happen. 1997 on the dot happened. So that's what I'm really... Uh, Ambassador Feldman, the lights we put on the table. Let's start with the Hamas-Palestinian Authority divide and how you see it wearing a UN hat, reconstruction of Gaza, and the other surrounding issues. Well, well let me start by saying thank you for the invitation. And Tony, it's great to Tommy. see you. And, and I also very much enjoy being listening again to my friend Salam Fayyad with his wisdom. I'm afraid that we in the UN are still on some of the old paradigms that Salam is putting aside because, you know, our, our operating... Um, 
rules derived from the Security Council resolutions or in the absence thereof, General Assembly resolutions. And so we still very much support Palestinian unity, but within the context of the PLO, commi of the PLO commitments. Um, Can you get from here to there, you think? Well, we, sometimes, I feel, sometimes yeah. I feel like um, we're the only ones who say this, but we very much would like to see the government of national consensus actually work. You know, this, this derived out of, the, out of the April reconciliation understanding between, between Hamas and, and Fatah. A, in theory, a government of national consensus was formed. We see that as the tool to bring about a legitimate um, and accountable government for all of Palestine. Um, but it's going to be hard to get there. Right now, as I say, we seem to be the strongest advocates. I don't see a whole lot of advocacy for empowering the government of national consensus from other quarters. But we certainly, we certainly believe that you cannot address effectively the challenges in the Gaza Strip, socioeconomic, weapon smuggling, what have you, if you don't have a legitimate and accountable Palestinian government in place that right now the best tool, for, the best vehicle for doing so seems to be the government of national, of national consensus. But, the, but one of the things that we're working on at the UN in the short term, of course, are the humanitarian needs. The, you know, 20,000 housing units destroyed, or be, you know, not inhabitable, another 40,000 damaged, 111 UN facilities damaged, three of which will have to be reconstructed entirely, three, um, two schools and a maintenance facility. And so the first thing on our agenda right now is trying to address some humanitarian issues, the immediate energy, water, shelter needs, and then move into a way that we can try to build a mechanism with the Israelis and the Palestinian government that would allow the reconstruction material to go in. This is going to be a massive undertaking. But aren't these interrelated? Yes. They're absolutely interrelated. Um, but it's going to take commitment on both sides in order to have the type of mechanism that would, that would allow sufficient quantities to meet the scale of reconstruction needs in Gaza right now. Um, I'll give you one, just one illustrative st statistic. There are still 63,000 Palestinians living in UNRWA schools. 63 Palestinians. Now, at the height of the fighting, it was up to 290-some thousand, almost 300,000, living in UNRWA schools. Uh, there are still 63,000. That's more people than took shelter in schools during the 2008-2009 fighting. We have to find a way to get those, to, get, to return some sense of normalcy to those people's lives. We have to put the schools back in operation. One out of every five schools still has, refu still has displaced in them. Um, so it's, it's not something we can ignore. So we look ahead and think we have to get back to, a to where the, you can see a political horizon again, but the short-term needs are great. And to have a mechanism that would allow reconstruction to take place, we can build on the precedent of what was there after 2008, 2009, but that was a small mechanism. That was a mechanism that allowed construction material for UN projects, and it didn't work very fast. There were UN projects that were never um, approved by the Israelis. So, so to, to make a mechanism for reconstruction, it's going to have to do four things simultaneously. It's going to have to satisfy the Israelis that there's sufficient security assurances there, meaning monitoring of where of civilian const of civilian construction, where civilian construction material goes. Second, it's going to have to be of sufficient scale to 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 meet the needs. Um, third, it's going to have to provide donors with the assurance that this stuff's going to move, so that they will put money into the reconstruction because they don't, no donors like to put money into something that they, that they feel isn't going to actually work. And then fourth, we have to have sufficient capacity um, to move the stuff across. And so, th so right now, we're focusing on negotiations between the Israelis, the Palestinians, and ourselves of how you build that mechanism to allow reconstruction and to And do you place. think that mechanism should be based on a Palestinian Authority-led government of national unity, and could that mechanism help lead to the strengthening of such an entity? That, that is certainly one of the aims of this mechanism, is, is to have a legitimate, accountable Palestinian government that's, that is on, at the crossing points, that sets priorities for reconstruction, that is our partner for making this mechanism work. Uh, Dr. Fayad, to what extent do you see the Palestinian Authority able to and should be the leader in this? 
Uh, I, I think there are <coughs> two main components to this. The international component, uh, which my friend Jeff talked about, and I think certainly in so far as the United Nations itself is concerned, uh, there is quite strong a presence on the part of the UN, particularly UNRWA, but not only UNRWA, uh, UNDP, food, the World Food Program, and other uh, uh, agencies and, and uh, programs. And I think they have done uh, uh, remarkable work, uh, and, and they should be praised for it, uh, while the war was underway. And they continue to be looked to uh, in the interim now, where more relief work needs to be done, but also during the reconstruction phase. The extent to which there is coordination with the rest of the donor community is not something that I know enough about, and out of government, maybe Jeff knows something about that, but I think some of that activity must be taking place ahead of the conference that's supposed to be held on October 12th uh, for that purpose. By then, I hope, and this is the second component, it be clear how the PA is going to be able to execute the program of uh, reconstruction. Uh, there's no, no question uh, that it should uh, assume key responsibility and, and, and play a lead role uh, in the implementation of what is needed. Uh, and that is why uh, I think uh, I'm all for what Jeff talked about in terms of uh, there being a unity government. Uh, a government that exists right now is a government of consensus that, uh, that was formed before the war, I think late mm -hmm. May, early June, uh, with the war happening a month later or something like that. Uh, now, the extent to which it is going to be able to do it, there's no question it should be the one to do it. The government, the personal government should do it. And there is government that everybody agrees to, supposedly. Question is, can it do it uh, under existing conditions with there being this much discord on the domestic Palestinian political scene? You uh, mean between Hamas and the PA uh, leaders? Yes, and I think it's absolutely important for that to be dealt with. I mean, I think we be kidding ourselves if, in fact, there is a notion out there that somehow, because we wish it to happen, a personal government is going to be able to do it. I mean, we definitely would want to see this happen. But there is fundamental work that needs to be done in order to enable the government to actually carry out its So which plan B? Uh, I think for there to really be serious dialogue. Uh, okay. There was Palestinian dialogue that led to the formation of this government. And I think it's important for there to be a serious discussion in the context of the so-called unified leadership framework. Uh, this is something that the Cairo Accord had provided for, that the most recent accord that gave rise to the existing government called for, which is a convening of this forum of factions, inclusive of everybody. Not only the PLO factions, but the factions that are not under the PLO. And to really lay out all of the issues and try to really come to a common view on how we Palestinians as a whole need to proceed domestically and so far as national governance is concerned, including rehabilitation, reconstruction in Gaza, but also overall national governance, as I call it. And two, how best we can position ourselves to deal with the process of peacemaking in a lot more effective way than we've been able to do so far when we are in state of this court. That is why I say, I came to the conclusion that we need to take it a step beyond where the United Nations is mm -hmm. today. And we appreciate what the United mm -hmm. Nations is today, because it was not long ago that a government of the kind that we have even right now was regarded as acceptable to the world. The government we have right now is acceptable to the United Nations, is acceptable to the United States, is acceptable to Europe, and that is progress to the quarter generally. Mm -hmm. That's progress relative to the national unity government which we had in 2007. Uh, is it enough? That's the question. I had hoped it would be. I still hope and wish it, it can be. But we really need to get on with it and have a serious discussion amongst the factions um, to yeah. empower it. Yeah. And to empower it without there being agreement on a platform that unites all Palestinians. Uh, and I, I, I don't think it's going to be possible, uh, uh, certainly not productive. Ambassador Feltman, do you There are 19. 19 UN agencies, funds, and programs that work, that, that work with the Palestinians. Um, so it's, it's, it is a large, large UN presence. Um, as I often joke, I, watching the UN, now I'm part of the UN, the UN for the last two years, I have a new appreciation for the flexibility and nimbleness of the US State Department, yeah. which, which, were not, which were not words I used when I worked for the US State Department. But these 19 agencies um, 
are coordinating among themselves and then, and then in turn coordinating with the international donor community in advance of a, of a September 22nd AHLC meeting in advance of the October 12th re, uh, meeting on, on reconstruction. It's been called by the Norwegians and the Egyptians. But our assumption is that we are going to have to do a lot in terms of helping whatever the Palestinian government is in the Gaza Strip build its capacity. That there's going to have to be a lot more work done with Palestinian ministries, with Palestinian institutions so that they can take on the challenge of reconstruction, government reform, governance. The sorts of things that happened in the West Bank under Prime Minister Salam Fayyad need to happen in the Gaza need to happen in the Gaza What is Strip. the role of the UN, international organizations, and even the ICC uh, for the Palestinians if they want to make a next move? I mean, the Palestinians, you, you, you've all read what the Palestinians are talking about. Correct. They're talking That's about, they're talking about, about something similar to what, what Dr. Fayad just, just talked about, which is to try to get the United Nations through the Security Council or failing that through the General Assembly to send, set an end date for mm -hmm. the occupation and then work back from there. That's, that, that's what the Palestinians have told us that they, are, that they are considering, the Palestinian leadership is considering. And they've said that if this doesn't work, then they will proceed with signing up for more international conventions, agencies, funds, and programs, et cetera. I don't know what they'll, what they'll actually do in practice, but that's what, they have, that's what they've talked to us about is the way that they want to approach their agenda. We're, we right now are looking at, as I said, the humanitarian aspects, the recovery aspects that, that are needed. How do you promote a more sustainable ceasefire? There's supposed to be talks in Cairo um, between the parties to turn this current ceasefire into something more permanent. Right. Those, no one showed up yet. Um, how, do you re how, do you, how do you build, help promote a responsible, accountable, unified government? How do you, what do you do with the West Bank? How do you, how do you promote progress in the West Bank? You know, I think that seeing things like announcement of a thousand of a thousand acres being declared state land in, in outside Bethlehem on, on August 25th is moving the wrong direction we need to move forward with the West so Bank what is well. the UN's reaction to that Bethlehem land issue concerned alarmed this is the wrong step to take you know the, as we have said all along there needs to be a process by which the Palestinians have planning and building authority in Area C in the West Bank, that, there needs to, that, the, that the Palestinians need to see progress in the West, in the West Bank as well as progress in the And West I'm sorry, State. I was going to interject a moment because you keep saying we. What do you mean by we? The Secretariat? It's a, it, I mean, yes, basically it's a, it's a good question because, because when I say we, I'm referring to the Secretariat, but we, we work within the constraints of the member state directions. Um, in, in terms of the Security Council resolutions or the General Assembly resolutions in the absence of So Security would the Council. Secretariat now take a more active role that the U.S. peace process has slowed down a little bit, these things are happening, the Palestinians seem to be ready to go to the U.N.? The way that we look at this is, is we think that we can work with the Palestinians and the Israelis to help build a better foundation for returning to the, to the peace process. We right now are not putting out any peace process plan of our own. Um, we're trying to, to deal with the issues that could establish a better atmosphere for, for grappling with the political issues. You have to go to you have Okay, to but my ears pick issues. up when you say we right now are not putting out a peace plan. Does that mean that's something you would consider doing at some point? We would be, you know, we'll continue to consult with, you know, the U.S., the other quartet partners, the other international community. But there's a big agenda right now in order to build the agenda back to the point where it's realistic to talk about the peace process. And the lack of trust between the Israelis and the Palestinians is deeper now than it was earlier this year. And, of course, Salam has already talked about the lack of trust between the two Palestinian factions. You have to, you have to somehow transcend that deepening lack of trust to get back to a political process. If you were to get back to a political process, what do you think would be the most helpful now? A U.S. peace plan being tabled, the U.N. stepping in with some ideas, the quartet re-engaging, or finding a way to have direct Palestinian-Israeli talks? All of the above, uh, I think would be okay. I mean, uh, no objection to, uh, you know, how the, the, the process is relaunched in, in terms of uh, the auspices under which that might occur. 
uh, you mentioned several players within the quartet, for example, and uh, that's uh, a possibility. What's really important from our point of view is the basis, you know, for relaunching the process. Uh, is this going to be a mad rush for resetting the uh, start button, restart button, on, on, or, or pushing the restart button negotiations? If it is that, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but is it going to be preceded by, preceded by a process that builds up our agenda, as in, in, in just words. Uh, ultimately, with the word ultimately uh, underscored, culminating in some form of United Nations Security Council resolution. But that does require preparation. When I say it's important for there to be agreement on a date certain for ending the occupation, I do not, and speaking for myself, uh, have in mind rushing to do this tomorrow. What I have in mind is a process that sets the stage for this, because we know the politics of the situation of this internationally. What is the point, unless really it's about making the point of going there, for that resolution to fail? <coughs> we want that activity to be successful. We want to go to the United Nations hand in hand with everybody in the international community to secure agreement that enshrines they certain for ending the Israeli occupation, and then work backward to end it. I think that this but is. But you say go hand in hand with everybody. There's yes. some in the quartet at yes. the moment that would be in favor of that. One assumes that Israel would be least in favor of that, right? And the United States, it's unclear where it would be. How do you see getting enough support for that plan? I think it's, it's important to take into account, of course, the disposition of the parties and principles to this. But so long as the process continues to be driven by that which one party to the negotiations thinks is the right way to go, particularly if that happens to be the occupying power, I think this process is doomed to continue to fail. This is the fundamental contradiction in, in what the process has been about. And so is there a plan B to that, which is to go demand UN recognition on I am own? all for this serious discussion, uh, including especially with Israel. You asked me before, what is it for Israel? Uh, would Israel agree to what we were talking about? I think it's important to engage a serious discussion with the Israelis uh, on the steps going forward. Are we going to forever continue to be pursuing an endless process for the sake of process or something that actually begins to deal with the issues. Um, certainly in terms of, you know, where this is going to land ultimately, but in the interim of, you know, issues like continued settlement expansion, for example, the right to life issues on the part of Palestinians, the right to live with dignity uh, on our land until the occupation ends. There are many, many issues that need to be fundamentally addressed before people begin to invest again. Why in was there process. not more of an outcry on the Bethlehem land issue? Uh, Within the Palestinians, even. Certainly, stronger words have just been said by Ambassador Feldman than I've heard. I don't know if words are going to continue to be enough, to be honest with you, uh, whether they're made by the United Nations with all due respect, or even by the United States and uh, other powers to be. Uh, there are a lot of words, maybe the timing, maybe given the horror of Gaza was, maybe the fact that we're literally still burying our dead and, and all of that for that, for that to happen in, in the midst of war and, and, and the rest of it explains why possibly maybe the reaction was muted, maybe because people have given up. And these are all valid reasons for our Israeli neighbors to begin to rethink their position on this. It's not that there is nothing in it for them. Two-state solution concept is as important from Israel's point of view as it is from Palestinians' point of view. Yes, it is supposed to deliver the right to live as free people with dignity in a country of our own, but it is going to mean sustainable security. Well, let me ask from, you directly, point of view. how bad was the Bethlehem land issue? Oh, it, 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 in, in the obvious material sense, uh, it is devastating for sure, in terms of it uh, uh, constituting uh, part of an activity that has been extremely detrimental to the continued, um, uh, the prospect of continued viability of two-state solution, where it is specifically uh, in connection in relation to Jerusalem is, of course, an added uh, complication and, and, and cause of major alarm and concern. But beyond that, politically, uh, we tend to, we have been conditioned to talk about settlement activity in terms of its negative impact 
in the obvious material sense of what settlement activity means, in the sense of it taking place precisely where that state of Palestine is supposed to emerge in order for the two state solution concept to uh, materialize. But the other side of this is political. Consider the extent to which this damages the standing of the PLO and the PA and the Palestinian government when this continues to happen. It is not that I like to admit that the PLO has become as weak as it is today, but I have to admit that it has become as weak as it is today. And in the main that happened, because it has invested in a process that has failed. Uh, and and uh, part of the, that failure is at least in part due to continued settlement expansion in the political... Uh, so what you're society. saying is that the PA and the PLO have cooperated in this process and even cooperated on intelligence matters and keeping the peace during the Gaza invasion <laughs> and then they get hit with the Bethlehem thing and it makes them look uh, impotent. That, that's the, the iron fools. Of it. That's the iron of it. Also a reminder of why it is that the process again needs to be bookended by a dead certain for ending the occupation. Because security cooperation and coordination in the context it was formulated within the Oslo framework and the con in the context in, in which it was and continues to be exercised ceases to make sense if that process is open-ended. Because would it would imply, it would imply mm -hmm. security coordination between the occupying power and the occupied in the history of the universe. It never happened that the most important function of the occupied people is to provide security on a continuing basis to the occupying power. That makes sense only in the context of a process that promises the occupied freedom with dignity in a country of their own. That is why it's in Israel's interest to understand the need to cooperate with us on trying to agree on a date certain for ending the Israeli occupation. And that's the sense in which I meant what I said when I said we need to go hand in hand. I am not interested in going to Security Council for the sake of going to Security Council to get another veto. I want for there the international community to stand to in full agreement on the need to deliver Palestinians their right to self-determination in the way they desire it to be. And all we're asking for is to be able to live in freedom and dignity in a country of our own. That's all. And that, I think, would be an important contributor to peace, stability, and security in the region, I would say, internationally. Israel has a lot at stake here. You asked me before, why should Israel agree to something less than the, uh, what the PLO committed to in 1993? You know, under my proposal, I'm not at all advocating that the PLO would give up on its platform. Actually, it's an integral part of my thinking that that platform should be kept intact, exactly the way it is. All I'm pointing to is the need for that framework, that CPLO, to be informed in its decision making by a broader forum, forum, one that is more inclusive than the PLO. You can't get Hamas and Jihad into the PLO today, given the PLO's platform. But you can include them in a broader forum that informs decision making within the PLO, keeping the PLO exactly as it is, with it being the sole legitimate representative of Palestinian people, uh, and with its platform intact, but with decision making by the PLO informed by what the broader forum uh, is about. I can't get Hamas and Jihad to commit to nonviolence in an open ended way, but is it possible for us to be able to agree on a time bound commitment to nonviolence? I you want to say. If that is possible, why give up on it? That's my point. If that's all we can do, why not take it? Okay, I'm going to open it up, but let me just clarify something I thought I heard you say to make sure I heard it right, which is if the date certain doesn't come about, then the Palestinian should end its security cooperation <coughs> with Israel. You know, I'm not... i prepared to really prescribe it in this way. All I'm really saying is we have to be able to be convincing. Part of the reason why the PLO finds itself in a position of weakness it is, and the PA, of course, by extension, is the fact that it is no longer able to be adequately convincing to the people it governs and it represents. Mm -hmm. And key tenet to good governance is being able to be adequately representative of people you're supposed to represent. It is not enough for someone in a position of leadership to say, I personally believe in such and such. It's good to hear, but can you carry as the question?
How can you be expected to carry if you do not adequately represent, if you do not really represent the pain, the suffering, the aspirations of people? Mm -hmm. And that's what's needed here. That's what I'm saying. You know, the PA and the PLO cannot continue to be persuasive and convincing to the public at large, saying we need to continue and we must continue to provide security to our Israeli mm -hmm. neighbors if they are unable to carry those people and, and our, our own people and to be credible uh, in, in convincing them that there is going to be an end to the suffering. Yeah. Ambassador, did you have a point to add to that or should I to go to the question? Just go to the floor. Uh, uh, Janice Berman. Yeah. Janice Berman. Israel or the PA, until Israel or the PA or the PLO get it together or the UN get it together to come up with a solution, are the funders in the Muslim countries stepping up to actually, the supporters of Hamas in the Muslim countries stepping up to just help the people on the ground? Have they been approached to lead the charge? All right. Ambassador, you get to go. We have uh, yeah. a couple days ago, the UN and the, and the, the Palestinian Authority together um, sent out a request for five hundred fifty million dollars um, for the initial humanitarian and early recovery needs of the Gaza Strip. This is even in advance of, of some donor meetings that we referred to that are coming up. Um, we certainly hope and would expect that some of the Arab, some of the Arab. Um, Arab brethren of the Palestinians would come forward in helping us meet that. Traditionally, however, there's not a whole lot of Arab funding that comes through the United Nations. Um, any Arab funding tends to go directly to whatever faction that particular Arab country wishes to support. Um, there have been a few exceptions where we've been able to get Arab money, but in general, the Arab countries do not tend to use UN um, financing mechanisms to address the humanitarian needs. I think that the I think that the change of government in Egypt has made a big difference in terms of what flows to Hamas in, in Gaza, for example. Certainly, certainly, with with the Egyptian campaign to shut down the tunnel the tunnel trade, which is which should help us on the arms smuggling question, it's also cut off some of the humanitarian supplies, money that was flowing through those tunnels. But I don't know if you have anything to add on mm -hmm. that, Salam. Um, no, not much to add by way of information. But but I think it is widely expected uh, that Arab countries are going to be part of the uh, uh, base of support uh, for the effort going forward, whether in the construction, which is going to be massive, uh, and also uh, the ongoing needs of the PA as those stood even before the war. Uh, and that's an important part of the equation. And it's likely to continue to be the case for a number of years, actually. Yeah. Right here, I want you to identify yourself. Yes. Um, sorry, my name is from uh, one of my questions is that given the sorry, um, given the uh, issue of summits with Israel invading into the West Bank, is it a room for a unified Israel-Palestine Israel Republic with proportional representation instead of uh, direct representation? With In other words, a one-state solution that's democratic? Once the solution that's, yeah, which is democratic, but Palestine will get a certain guaranteed amount of votes, Israel will get a guaranteed amount of votes. Not stated in terms of preferences. I mean, I wouldn't really uh, refer to it as a solution, but, but the reality. I mean, uh, in the absence of agreement on the contours of settlement uh, that produces a, a Palestinian state uh, able to live in peace, <coughs> harmony, and security with the state of Israel. Uh, reality of occupation is going to continue uh, with there being an obvious problem, particularly for the State of Israel, in terms of how it could continue to project itself internationally and also to its own people, its own public, as democratic state uh, uh, with, uh, at the same time, dominion over the fate and livelihood uh, of, in today's count, 4.6 million Palestinians in Gaza Strip and West Bank, including Jerusalem. This is really a fundamental question. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we stood for and we continue to stand for I do um, uh, emergence of a fully sovereign state of Palestine uh, alongside the state of Israel. Um, that's the solution that we would like to see happen, and uh, yeah. as part of the solution of the conflict. Right here. 
Thank you. Yes, my name is Saeed Erekat. I'm a Palestinian journalist. I was also a UN spokesman in Iraq for five years and <laughs> your pre Welcome predecessor. Back. So, uh, my question to you, uh, Dr. Fayyad, is that the day before yesterday was the 21st anniversary of the Oslo Agreement. And I want you to tell us how much better off the Palestinians today now than they were 21 years ago. And has the time really come perhaps just to fold the tent and just, you know, back, basically go back to the occupation and what would be the role of the UN in doing so? Because under the occupation, or let's say before 1994 or 93, there were no walls, there were, the land was not being taken, grabbed, you know, day in and day out. Palestinians were not being killed in mass as they were in Gaza lately. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one reason we're having discussion we're having is because uh, the obvious answer to the question is we, 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 it's difficult to really see a way in which we are better off. Uh, I think beyond, beyond the obvious. Uh, and I don't think we really should take this away from the record. I mean, uh, you know, I don't certainly wish to be understood to be a detractor to a process that involved some form of recognition, not adequate recognition, I would say, of our right to live as free people with dignity in a country of our own. But beyond that, the process certainly did not uh, proceed well, and I do not believe it was managed well either. Uh, you're, you're right, uh, 21 years later, here we are. If we're talking about uh, the obvious sense in which the question probably was meant, maybe in economic terms, uh, certainly, uh, there are serious problems. We can't really get into that, but uh, uh, it, it's obvious. I mean, in terms of uh, hardship, uh, poverty, unemployment, and what have you, uh, it, it's a serious problem. But beyond that, and that's, I believe, why we're here today, uh, politically speaking, and, and that is really the issue. Uh, the point that I'm really <coughs> trying to do attention to is the need for that process to be looked at anew, not with a view to ditching it, and forgetting about it, but to really thinking objectively and calmly about how it might be adjusted, particularly in the two key areas I delineated for adjustment, in order for it to produce that which was intended to be produced, even though Oslo itself was silent on Palestinian statehood. Palestinian statehood. I mean, that's, that basically is, is what it is. I don't think you know uh, it's too late. Uh, there's been a lot of hardship. There continues to be a serious threat to security and stability in connection with this conflict continuing to be unresolved. And that's yet another reason why I think Israel should find it in its interest to engage with the Palestinians on the basis of the adjustments that I described to you. Uh, because here we are, notwithstanding its military might, there are limits to military might, obviously. <laughs> Uh, look at what happened, 51 <coughs> days of continuous bombardment and all. And can anyone tell me that that really has led in any way to degrading uh, command and control on, on, on the part of Palestinian resistance? It's not, not, not self-evident, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And at a huge cost. So clearly, we live in a world, and this is really the case, uh, that countries run into, the world runs into, wherever you have a case of non-state actors. And it's not really only where we are. Uh, so clearly you really need to find a way to be accommodative. <coughs> not without principles, but to me it seems like agreement on a time-bound commitment to non-violence is certainly better than no commitment to non-violence. Mm -hmm. It falls short of absolute commitment to non-violence, but it is uh, a halfway house between the two. Possibly during that time of bank, com uh, bank commitment to nonviolence, we could find a way to converge more on, on, on a platform that's more acceptable. And I think by definition, that convergence must occur around the time when settlement is about to be had. But is the settlement around the corner? I don't think it is today. No. Zia Ali, who uh, yeah. was our partner in the U.S. Palestinian partnership way back. Welcome back, Zian. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, and I welcome the contribution and comment of uh, the Ambassador. Uh, you refer to the dialogue yes. uh, between the parties, which is commendable and necessary overdue. 
There's another dialogue that's not really been taking place, and that is with the Palestinian people. Dialogues between governors and governed are usually done through tools, like parties, like elections. The last elections that we had was, I believe, the presidential was in 2005, and the one that followed was in 2006. Uh, when would elections be feasible to be part of this dialogue? And is it, is it uh, enough to have uh, elections a month from now where the dialogue is already one between Hamas and Fatah? Or should we take time for a campaign where these issues are, uh, are actually discussed? I would welcome your view of elections proceeding with the campaign as part of the election. And I uh, welcome the contribution of the ambassador about how come the Palestinians get away with no elections. So, well, first of all, I, I think um, the math is right uh, on when elections happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, you got it right in 2006 and, and 2005. And uh, we, we definitely need uh, to have elections again. Uh, you know, no one can, uh, in this day and age, continue to lay a claim to being representative uh, without the regularity and predictability with which the system opens its itself up for the election. And I think it's, um, uh, and elections again, it's, it's, it's very important. It's incidentally, it is part of the cure, an element, not, not everything, uh, of, of trying to deal with a region that's so tragically caught up in, in violence and extremism. <coughs> that itself is manifestation of poor governance in, in, in some important way. Failure, failure, massive failure. Uh, a massive failure on, on the part of governments and, and regimes to be adequately responsible and responsive to the needs of their own people. And I think this is a really key element, and I do not believe the debate as to what to deal with and how to deal with uh, ISIS or ISIL uh, these days uh, should continue to proceed without paying adequate attention to the fact that it's very important to uh, keep those issues in mind, issues of, of good governance. Uh, in, in, in the constructions that, construction that I have in mind, uh, in terms of way forward, involving dialogue uh, amongst you know, factions, implicit, implicit to my thinking is the need f uh, uh, for there to be agreement on a, a timeline of sorts. For elections? Um, for a number of things, beginning with uh, basic question, if, if this meeting of all factions is convened, so-called uh, unified leadership framework, for our own reasons, I think we need a little bit of time of quiet to be able to rebuild, to reconstruct, and to unify our state official institutions and laws after more than seven years of separation. It sounds eminently logical for me for this to be a Palestinian expectation uh, of ourselves and preference for ourselves. Question is, how long? Um, uh, I haven't stated, uh, but that, uh, I leave it up to the factions to come to a view on this. But once they agree that this is uh, the timeline that we need in order for us to be able to do those chores, I think then our leadership can and should take that timeline to Israel and to the international community, saying on behalf of all Palestinians, this is what President Abbas then can say, on behalf of all Palestinians, <laughs> on behalf of all factions, I can tell you, everybody is committed to run violence for this length of time. Under that construction, I had in mind, and I proposed, having elections no more than six months before the end of that timeline. So without even mentioning a, a, a number of years for fear that I'd be quoted on how long that period of time is going to be. Say uh, it's after X, uh, in my formulation, at least six months before X ends, there should be elections. Would you Th run? Th this is, <laughs> I'll, I'll answer the question. Uh, this, should give, this should give everybody enough time to prepare. You're right about the point uh, of the public space. W where is the public space? Uh, whether in, the, in Palestine or the Arab world for that matter. I mean, you look at the region, again, tragically caught up in violence. Where is that public space? That's the point that really should not be ignored. I think we Palestinians, with good reason, pride ourselves on being an open society. 
one that has really benefited from the strength of incredible, remarkable contributions by our civil society. And I think, true to tradition, true to form, I think this tradition needs to be uh, preserved, if anything, actually strengthened. It is thanks to the civil society that we were able, our people were able to endure during many, many decades of oppression and occupation before the personal authority showed up. And I think it's very important to open that political space in order for people to have uh, 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 the possibility and opportunity to exercise their right to choose uh, their leaders. And it's important for that process, in fact, to be inclusive, fair, and open. And, and, and in the interim, to open up the political space, as a matter of fact, and the political system for participation, including on the part of youth, that's very important, half our population, totally disenfranchised. People wonder about the region, where is it really going and how is it going to really be dealt with? With the youth totally ignored, not featuring on anybody's agenda, how can you possibly? And this begins to answer your question, and I do not know the extent to which I really uh, you know, talk about that. But, but a political movement that's not able to respond to the needs of the youth and to be thought of, of as significant or relevant from their point of view, you know, does not have much of a chance, should not, to be honest with you, have much of a chance. Uh, any political movement must really be, present itself as one that is going to be democratic from inception, from inception, from the very beginning. No leadership that's really imposed from above. If, in fact, something like this can be thought of as um, a unifying uh, starting point of, of analysis in, in, in political terms, most certainly this is something that should have the support of people uh, uh, like me and others. Uh, we're all for uh, empowering people because that's really where it ultimately resides. Freedom is completely indivisible. You know, for us Palestinians, this is about free, freedom from occupation, but it's really about freedom generally and uh, freedom to choose and, and being able being able to exercise that choice freely. In so what I'm way. sort of hearing you yeah. say is that the first question is not whether you would run, but yeah. you might think about starting a new democratic-based political movement that had a youth focus first. I, I most certainly would be most interested and keen on supporting a democratic movement that's responsive to the needs and aspirations of our people, especially those disenfranchised. You know, Palestine is about nothing. And it's, it's not going to be for anyone if it is not going to be for our poor, if it's not going to be for the disenfranchised, if it's, go, if it's not going to be for those who really go to sleep every day with concern that they may not be able to find enough to provide for the welfare of their, of their families and, 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 and dependents. What you're talking about school children and all. Uh, this is what it is about. It's really about building toward that kind of future. And for that, yes, I support it myself and everyone else, I believe, who is in position to promote that kind of change, promote that kind of political agenda, I certainly called upon to do that without presumption as to what my own personal role is going to be in this. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. If I may say, <laughs> I hope this doesn't sound bad for either of you. You sound just like Hillary Clinton did yesterday in Iowa. But, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, right here and then in the way back. Oh, right here and then you and then in the way back. Yes. Yes. Uh, we're doing a youth movement here, <laughs> picking on the younger hands. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is Noah Schoen, and I'm a student at Columbia University. Um, and I just want to say, what an honor it really is to hear you speak um, you. and your, your optimism in the face of a very challenging situation. And I thank the ambassador for being here as well. Um, my question is this, as, as the leader of the Palestinian people, you made, a public, you made public commitments to the two-state solution. You renounced violence. You developed the West Bank economically. And you made pragmatic steps towards peace. My question is, how did it feel when the diplomatic response from Israel was continued settlement building, the continued impunity of settler violence, stopping pro building projects like Rawabi from going forward? As Dr. Sam, uh, Mr. Sambahur shared with me, the limiting of resources in the West Bank like telecom lines. How did that feel? And yeah, yeah. Uh, 
pretty bad. I can't remember. <laughs> you can't do everything, I mean, for sure. Uh, and, 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 and that is really, you know, these are, you know, factors, among others, that really have contributed to the situation being what it is. Uh, you know, but I'm, I will never lose hope about this. Uh, let me tell you, uh, I, I think, you know, to think that uh, a situation of injustice, deep injustice, is something that can be sustained is, is full of them. And, and, I, and I think uh, it, it really would be to the detriment of everyone, uh, of everyone concerned. Not only Israel, but just about everyone, uh, to continue to really operate on the basis of premise that this is somehow sustainable. It isn't. It can't be by definition. Uh, you can achieve security on the strength of force, but you cannot sustain it on the strength of force alone. There has to really be a sense of justice. People have to really feel uh, that they belong to an order of sorts. In this case, a regional order. That provides justice uh, in a reasonable way. Uh, then and only then uh, can we really talk about things in, in, in more rational terms. So I, I think these are factors that really have contributed to the situation being what it is, with the PLO having been reduced to the situation of weakness it finds itself in, and, and the PA. And with it, credibility with the people. You know, you can't, I mean, that's again, I keep going to this point. What is the point of continuing to say, I believe in this and I believe in that if I can't carry. I mean, that's very important and that is why I think it's really important to really give people of the region, our people in this case, Palestinian people, uh, the space uh, and, and uh, uh, in, in the sense of uh, it being understood when our people demand, you know, responsive, you know, government, uh, that they are really well within their right to expect a responsive uh, representation in the same way that people in this country, for example, uh, are expected you know, to be a source of legitimacy for, for the government, its uh, decision-making processes and, and what have you. Not to continue to deal with us, whether Palestinians or Arabs more generally, uh, uh, on a for-granted basis. You know, all you need is to invest in leadership that is expected to be able to, at some point, sign a peace treaty with Israel, and don't worry about anything else. That's the only thing that really matters. That's so disrespectful of, of people, uh, their desires, their wishes, and their right to be representative, uh, represented by a competent and fair government. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's important. Yes, ma'am, right here. Hello, my name is Julia Volpe, and I'm with uh, SEGL, and I want to, I understand that in Israel, after graduating from high school, men must serve two years in the army. Do you think that that affects the conflict between Israel and Pakistan in any way? Palestine, you mean? Palestine? Yeah, sir. And if it does, how? Why don't we, uh, I don't know if Ambassador Feldman wants to tackle that one, but we haven't gotten you in here in this discussion enough. Um. I don't have much much to to say about about how Israel you know governs itself. The rules that Israel has has in terms of, of treatment of what its own citizens' requirements are. You know, the United Nations is made up of member states. You look at the the 193 members of the United Nations, you see a great diversity in things like military service, representational government, etc. Um, but I think what's what's important is that there be an understanding on the Israeli side of what the Palestinian existential fears are, what the Palestinian desire for life and dignity, control of their own destiny are, just as I think that the Palestinians um, need to be aware of the existential concerns that the Israelis have. One of the things that I've noticed, both in my US um, career, as well as now in the UN, is how, the pal how too often Palestinians and Israelis really misread each other, for knowing each other so well, for having lived, lived next to each other for so long, for having endured the occupation, which I think both societies suffer from for so long, there's, a, there's sometimes a fundamental misunderstanding. Um, and, and if both sides could help address that, so much the better. And I don't think it has anything to do with, with a rule for two years of military service or not. Lots of countries have, have military service. But, but let me take an example. If you talk to 
so, you know, many Israelis about the settlement activity, um, about the confiscation of land, declaration of state lands. I don't think that they truly can t understand how um, this undermines Palestinian confidence in the process, how this um, destroys Palestinian hopes that they'll ever have a state when they see when they see when they see the settlements expand. And the Israelis, in the in the negotiations I've been, they, they don't talk about it in a way that illustrates they get it. The same way with the Palestinians, you talk about Israel's security fears, which are are more real now than they were given the given the tunnel thing. You, you'll find almost a dismissive attitude, like, well, we'll fix the security thing, we'll, we'll find a way to address the security thing that doesn't give the, the Israelis confidence that the Palestinians get it. So you have this, this, these two fundamental issues, the land for the Palestinians, the security for the Israelis, where the two sides talk past each other, uh, say, oh yeah, we get it, we get it, and they don't. So, I, so I'm less concerned about whatever the rules are that Israel has for its um, you know, for its, its young people in, in terms of military service, then how Israel prepares them to live side by side in peace and security with the, with the Palestinians. Well said, Mr. Ambassador. Yes, sir, I've seen your hand. Yeah. I'll, I'll try. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for speaking. Um, uh, I'm a student at, um, my name is Anwar Issa, and I'm a student at the George Washington University, as well as an intern with the American Task Force on Palestine. And uh, my question uh, is a bit of a long one, but it regards Gaza um, and uh, the political leadership within Gaza, um, as it's often seen as an impediment um, to uh, a two-state solution um, with uh, Hamas in power. Um, and after the, after the war, Hamas has uh, more popularity than it did before. Um, and so my, my question um, to Dr. Fayyad is, um, what, what steps uh, can be taken to increase the legitimacy uh, of the Palestinian Authority within Gaza? Um, and um, you know, will it be uh, politically internalizing uh, Hamas, which we see didn't really work out um, as Israel rejected the unity government between um, the, uh, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas? Um, and so, you know, what, what options remain? Um, because if you, uh, you, you know, then there's the argument that Israel basically says, oh, well, you know, you, you don't have control of Gaza, so um, we can't really have peace talks with you. That's a good question, Glenn. Uh, I tend to think in terms of, uh, at least for starters, what, what makes sense from our own point of view. Uh, it's not that, you know, what Israel thinks or does not, you know, doesn't matter or, or thinking the part of international community does not matter. It, it does, but, but I think things have to make sense from our own point of view before anything else. We have yet to have a, a coherent plan uh, of sorts that we can go to the world with. Before I worry about what Israel would say about some kind of accommodation with Hamas, question for me as Palestinians is, can I really have, can I get into uh, uh, a meaningful accommodation with Hamas, uh, something that is inclusive of everybody, something that makes sense to us, you know, given our own objectives. It isn't until I get there that I begin to really ask questions as to where Israel is, uh, is on this issue. And it's not because I don't think it matters, it matters. But let me remind you of something basic. You know, when this, uh, the, the current Palestinian government was formed, I believe in late May, early June, uh, Israel made all kinds of negative statements about it, said, you know, saying you know, this is something that it, it could not really live with, it could not accept. And repeatedly, Prime Minister of Israel saying things like, you know, Abnazin had to choose between either, you know, continuing on in this cohabitation with Hamas or peace negotiations with, uh, with Israel. You, you remember all of that. Yet, amazingly, uh, while the war was still going on, you know, Israel started to shift its position on, on, on the government. Uh, I don't remember exactly the words, but with, with Israel and the rest of the international community saying that they expected the Palestinian Authority to play a lead role, to assume a lead role in the reconstruction of Gaza, what else are they really talking about if they're not talking about Palestinian government? So I can't really you know, worry too much as to where Israel is on that issue today. What I should worry about more is the extent to which we are willing to entertain, enter into a meaningful national dialogue with a view to forging a meaningful national consensus on the pressing issues of war and peace, beginning with 
What is it that we really need in order for us to rebuild our own country, institutions, reunite them and all? How long is it going to really take us? There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's, you know, use my, my friend Jeff's words uh, in terms of things presumed. Nothing can be presumed about uh, having to really put together institutions that have been separate uh, and totally uh, decimated as a consequence of seven years of separation. This is not automatic. It's not going to happen all by itself. It requires serious work uh, uh, and preparation. It takes us time to do this. Can we really agree on how to do this? Can we, can't we really agree that in, in our interest to all agree on a period of quiet in order for us to be able to do this? Can't we then offer all of this as a Palestinian position that represents everybody? I think if we have that, we have something to talk to the world about. If we don't, then we stay in the realm of, well, if we do this, Israel will accept it, the US would not accept it, etc., back and forth. I think we will continue to fail so long as we continue to condition our own thinking this way. Let us be proactive. Let us make sense to our own people. Let's be responsive to the need for us to be united in a meaningful way. Look, you know what I'm really talking about is not that revolutionary. You know, my friend Jeff said, you know, I'm kind of a little bit, I have pushed the envelope, I'm outside the orthodoxy. Not by much. You know, if you really think, if you really think about it, not by much. The first plank in the proposal that I have is everybody needs to agree that the PLO would continue to be the sole legitimate representative of Palestinian people and it would continue to retain its platform as is and its membership is going to stay as it is until such time that there are elections for the Palestinian National Council or otherwise agreement on a, an objective way for broadening, broadening the base of participation of PLO. But in parallel, you know, have this you know, broader forum that includes everybody. Ambassador Fahman. Should, should uh, let, me, let me start off with the statistic. In 2000, the UN was, was providing food assistance to less than 80,000 Palestinians in Gaza. Less than 80,000 Palestinians were receiving UN food, food assistance. Um, before this war started, the figure was over, oh, over 830,000. So from 2000 till now, it went from less than 80,000 to 830,000, requiring UN food assistance. That goes to the question of are things better off now or not that, that, that you asked, sir. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've got this massive reconstruction that's, un, you know, that's you know, unprecedented. This is, this is nearly 300 times, 300 percent what the damages were in 2008, 2009. We have to have a mechanism that allows massive quantities of reconstruction material as well as ongoing humanitarian assistance into the Gaza Strip. I mentioned this at the, at the beginning of my, of my remarks, and, it's gonna, and to make this work, Israel has to have some security assurances about where this stuff is going. It's, it's an incredible responsibility on the shoulders of the UN and other parts of the international community, but it's necessary. Um, but the only way that's going to work is if there's a Palestinian partner to it. The Palestinian partner has to be a unified Palestinian government of some sort. And so I think that the reconstruction needs in and of themselves and the needs to have the crossings open at the scale required will help prompt a Palestinian unified government. At least, at least it should if, the, if, if leaders on all sides are thinking about the future. There are a lot more questions and so I'm going to ask you all to stay here, and maybe we can do it more informally. We can have a discussion. People can come up. I'm sorry, Jeff, did you want to? No, I'm going to have to go shortly. Oh. <laughs> okay, but we'll stay on up here because I know a lot more people have questions, so let's just make it more informal. I want to thank our friends at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we love working with them, and they're part of this process as well. So please join us in giving a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> Yeah. 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 It's wonderful to see you. I, I,